today we'll be talking about water quality. We'll be talking about pollution. And the way we'll be talking about pollution is uh, I'm going to uh, talk about water quality and water pollution. And we'll look at that around the Great Lakes just to kind of keep it, uh, you know, local for us here, right? Just a couple things uh, having to do with water in the Great Lakes. Those are a few years ago now, right? But uh, 2016, this is the water uh, that was pulled directly out of Lake Erie. All right, green nastiness, right? Um, probably not something you want to drink, right? But uh, Michigan declares Western Lake Erie waters impaired, right? Uh, and then here's another one. Uh, Nestle bottling plant upgrade driving more groundwater extraction. There went from 150 to 400 gallons per minute uh, at one of its plants here. And we have probably, I think, six or eight Nestle bottling plants, many of them up to 400 gallons per minute now, bottling that as Ice Mountain and then selling it back to us, right? Um, I don't know if we talked about how much Nestle pays uh, per location each year for operating expenses. Uh, it's, or for, you know, to the state basically to withdraw the water. Um, it's $200 per year to file paperwork, right? Water is considered a public trust. So a company has pretty much as much right to it as you do. So they can, for 200 bucks a year per plant, withdraw 400 gallons a minute and, and uh, sell that back to you, right? Um, so, and that's happening all over uh, Michigan as well, right? Looking at the Great Lakes, uh, yes, we have evaporation, right? But uh, pollution doesn't leave during evaporation, right? Just like salt water, right? The pollution sticks around and it's just the pure water that evaporates, right? The only way the, the, water, the uh, pollutants have to get out of the Great Lakes is to leave through the St. Lawrence Seaway. And essentially only about 1% of the water in the Great Lakes leaves through the St. Lawrence Seaway each year. Um, which means essentially uh, when we're considering pollutants in respect to pollutants, the Great Lakes are essentially a closed system. In other words, what's here stays here, right? Um, pollutants that are dumped into the lakes remain there for a long period of time. And over time, as we dump more and more in, they become more and more concentrated, right? Now, back before the 1970s, you know, the early days, the idea was these lakes are huge. They'll just take it, right? Dilution is the solution. So pump into the lakes and they'll just dilute itself out and it'll be fine. Well, we started realizing that that wasn't, you know, really happening. Our lakes were really bad. We were killing them off. The uh, Cohagia River over in Ohio, um, caught on fire yes the river caught on fire in the late 1960s which kind of prompted the movements of uh and the the legislation of the clean water act and the clean air act of 1970 and 1972. excuse me sir i have a question yes it's only three of us yes okay um i'm with um india she's right here okay all right hi there's four of us then <laughs> all right fair enough just make sure uh when you um uh uh when we do the the we switch over and i have you type your names in type both your names in so i remember that you're both here okay all right fair enough all right thank you for letting me know that all right good good all right so um with again those pollutants the, the idea was they would become you know just diluted we you know just the lakes would take it but obviously they weren't so um what we uh we did with the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, those were the first regulations we really put into uh, effect of, you know, that effectively did anything for, you know, water or or uh, um, uh, air regulations. Um, and this is kind of when we first started seeing, remember when we were talking about mining and, you know, all the pollutants and everything that come from mining and mercury and, and sulfides. Nothing was done about those until the Clean Air and Clean Water Act of 1970s. So before then, we really didn't have much. Um, but cleaning up the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Michigan, especially um, uh, from Chicago, you know, through Gary, Indiana, all that industrial activity there, and then also over by Detroit, right? Those are becoming really, really bad. So our efforts to to clean up the lakes have actually, as one of our, you know, good doobie things as, as human beings, we've done a good job of cleaning up the lakes, not saying that there aren't any pollutants going in, right? Because even though we've cleaned up the lakes a lot, right? There's still a substantial number of pollutants entering the Great Lakes in very large quantities. And we'll look at some of those uh, today, right? 
So when we're talking concerns about water quality, right? First, we have to realize that, you know, water quality concerns can happen from natural processes, right? or anthropogenic processes. And that's a big $10 word. Anthro means us humans, right? So anthropogenic means caused by humans. So natural or caused by human processes, anthropogenic processes, right? Basically what they do is they impact the chemistry of the water, uh, which then impacts the quality of the water, right? Uh, things that can often affect water quality are, are mineral and water interactions, right? Those, the uh, uh, chemical, uh, breakdown of minerals due to the, the, the presence of water, right? Decay of organic matter. And you can see some organic matter lying in here. I don't know if anybody has been up to Tequamanon Falls up in the UP. Often uh, the water going over that is like rusty brown. And that's from a bunch of tannic acid uh, from decaying leaves and organic matter, right? Biological processes can obviously affect... Uh, um, water quality. Uh, and then one of the big uh, terms we'll be talking about uh, in this chapter is residence time. And residence time is how long uh, the pollutant sticks around in the environment, right? So how long before, you know, it kind of breaks down into, you know, whatever, right? But uh, how long does it stick around? And a lot of pollutants that are inorganic stick around for a long time, right? Nutrients are another big water quality issue that we're going to discuss, right? Nutrients, we always think of those as good, but always too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? Waste disposal is another thing that impacts water quality, right? How do we dispose of our waste, right? Sewage, right, is obviously one thing. We usually send that through a sewage treatment plant, but does that take out all of the material in there, right? Or, you know, is the sewage, as it sometimes does in Toronto, right in the Toronto Harbor, uh, when the water is, uh, when it rains, in order to not over pressurize the, the, the sewage system, uh, excess sewage gets dumped directly into the harbor at like six different spots uh, throughout the harbor, which is, you know, gross. It's not the only ones that do that. That's the big one I know of, right? Um, and then introduction of pharmaceuticals, right? Other synthetic chemicals, fragrances, right? Dump those those pills and stuff in the water and they dissolve, right? And apparently there are a bunch of really stoned fish floating around there, right? No, actually not. But um, what, it, what it does do is it messes with their reproductive timing and their reproductive cycles. So um, some of those pharmaceuticals getting into the water can mess with uh, fish and other aquatic uh, critters' um, 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 reproductive cycles, right? And then we all know fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, running off of farm fields and whatnot right, into lakes and rivers uh, can cause issues there. A couple different types of uh, pollution sources. First, we have point source solution. And this is, you know, you can point at the source of the solution, basically, right? So pollutants are easy to, to figure out where they're coming from, right? So my example of you know, raw sewage flowing out into the Toronto Harbor through pipes, that would be uh, an example of point source uh, sewage or point source pollution, right? Whereas non, and so the, the thing about point source, right, is you can point at the source, so it's easy to identify the source, it's easier to monitor, uh, and then easier to uh, mitigate and remediate and, and fix, right? Non point sources, on the other hand, the, the release of the pollutant here is just kind of, it's diffuse, it's all over, it's wherever. So like road salts, right? Um, fertilizer runoff from many farmlands, right? Acid drainage from strip mines, that kind of stuff, right? Um, the issue here is it's much harder to identify because you can't just point at the source, it's kind of coming from all over, right? So it makes, makes it much harder to monitor and therefore harder to mitigate, right? Let's look at some common uh, pollutants, right? First of all, pollutant uh, is defined as any substance that in excess is known to be harmful to desirable living organisms. We put desirable in there, right? Because we don't consider, um, you know, a, um, a weed killer to be necessarily, I mean, it is, it can be, but, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, in the amounts we want it on our lawn to kill those weeds, it is desirable, right? But once, 
it runs off of our our you know lawn and into a local stream or river right now it's affecting organisms that we actually do want around now it's become a pollutant right so the first big category are nutrients right um whoops nutrients especially phosphorus and nitrates right these are huge to um to um, uh, causing what we call eutrophication and excess nutrient loading of our lakes and rivers, right? Oxygen demanding waste, right? Common organic waste, fecal matter, poop, right? Uh, metals, heavy metals, we talked about those as, as uh, pollutants before. Pathogenic waste, microbes, right? Like uh, E. coli. Petroleum, right? Oil, natural gas spills into the uh, into the ecosystem, right? And then toxic waste, toxic being something that'll just kill you dead, right? Chemicals, heavy metals, radioactive waste, all that good stuff, right? And then a couple of things we don't think often about: sediment, sediment pollution, right? So if you got a farm field and you got a bunch of of sediment, right? So you got a bunch of uh, topsoil washing off into local streams and river, it can choke up those streams, it can clog them up. Right. Uh, and then another one that a lot of people don't think about are thermal plumes or thermal pollution. Right. Especially in uh, water. There's a lot of little aquatic critters, you know, that are, are very sensitive to the temperature zones that they live in. And if you have, say, you know, uh, um, a plant there that's pumping, you know, hot wastewater out into the lake, even if it's just water. Right. That change in temperature. Uh, can cause, can be a pollutant, can cause, um, you know, destruction of our desirable living organisms, right? So let's talk about nutrients first, right? So before European colonization of the Great Lakes region, right, many of the Great Lakes were what are called oligotrophic lakes. And oligotrophic means lacking in plant nutrients, right? or I should say having the correct amount of plant nutrients, not too much plant nutrients, right? And having large amounts of dissolved oxygen throughout, right? Now, this is important because fish don't breathe water, right? And, and critters in the water, they don't breathe the water. They filter out the dissolved oxygen, right? So there's little O2s floating around. They don't break down the hydrogen and oxygen and create, you know, hydrogen gas and then breathe the oxygen. They still breathe the oxygen, right? But they breathe it in the dissolved oxygen that's that's in the uh, in the water, right? No dissolved oxygen, the fish can literally uh, suffocate to death in the water, right? These oligotrophic lakes uh, have low nutrient levels, which is actually a good thing, right? Uh, they have good light penetration, high amounts of dissolved oxygen, you have deeper waters, low amount of algal growth and low amount of plant growth, right? This is where you're gonna have your sight predators like smallmouth bass, lake trout, pike, sturgeon, right? The ones that require, you know, or rely on visualization to hunt their prey, right? So there's a important fishies there, right? Again, so we say it has a lacking in plant nutrients. What we really mean is it has the proper amount of nutrients that it needs, right? Not too much, not too little. Uh, mainly, this is the, the nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Phosphorus and nitrogen, very important to us as fertilizers, right? But uh, once those run off and we increase the amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen, we overload the system with phosphorus and nitrogen and nutrients, right? We do get, um, you know, this phosphorus and nitrogen from natural sources, uh, decomposing plant matter, for example, right? But now a lot of the, you know, the sources is run off from farm fields and stuff, right? Um, so during this time, the Great Lakes were continuously cool, clear, deep, right, due to their immense size and depth, right? Now, the process of eutrophication, which is a natural process, right, uh, is the process by which one of these oligotrophic lakes becomes uh, enriched in dissolved nutrients, right? So excessive dissolved nutrients, right? This stimulates the growth of aquatic plant life. Uh, not just like these little plants that grow along the ground, but especially algal plant life, right? This algal plant life depletes the dissolved oxygen. Now you say, wait a minute there, professor, right? So uh, plants like algae, right? They intake CO2 
and breathe out oxygen. So shouldn't that increase the amount of dissolved oxygen? Well, yes, but also coming along with these um, um, algae are phytoplankton, many of which are little animals, right? Microscopic little animals by the trillions and trillions that then breathe that dissolved oxygen uh, to the point where they use it up so much that the, the fish basically um, will uh, suffocate in their own uh, in their own water, right? Um, so as lakes age, there's a buildup naturally of, of nutrients, right? Sediment that fills in the bottom and plant material. And given it enough time, you know, I'll think of like a little small, you know, inland puddle or lake, right? I mean, given that, you know, centuries or thousands of years, it'll eventually silt in with all that, that sediment, right? And then eventually become land again, right? So that satellite sediment slowly fills the basin. Eventually the process ends by becoming terrestrial again. So all of this, you know, fills in no more lake and now it's solid ground, right? Um, so this is a natural process. Uh, obviously, you know, our Great Lakes is going to, you know, take millions of years for that to happen too. But, um, you know, it's these smaller lakes that sometimes happens, right? Um, uh, and which means that, you know, the, the timing of this is naturally highly variable depending on the size of the lake, how much nutrients, all that kind of good stuff, right? The idea is this takes a long time, right? The process of eutrophication, right? So after European settlement and uh, industrialization, right, changed all of that. And now we started to pump uh, pollutants into the Great Lakes in, in uh, massive quantities. Again, the idea back in the day was, you know, dilution is the solution. Uh, just pump it into the lakes, they'll take it, no problem, right? Um, so the amount of nutrients entering our Great Lakes, right, of course, has, you know, in, incredibly intensified due to urbanization, agriculture, runoff, stuff like that, right? And like I said, before the 1970s, our lakes were really bad, right? Lake Michigan was even considered eutrophic, right? Now, cleaning these up has been one of our, you know, great accomplishments as, as human beings, um, but still lots of pollutants entering there, right? So the idea here is eutrophication. It does happen naturally, right? But the more nutrients we add in, right, then it stimulates more aquatic plant growth, which depletes the dissolved oxygen. And, you know, now we have one of these eutrophic lakes. Well, as you can see the green water here, lots of algae. And our site predators are gone, right? There's no, They can't see anymore. They're, they can't hunt, right? So now we get things like carp, bullhead, catfish, things that use their hunt at night often and use their uh, electrical lateral line system to, to find food rather than, than visualization, right? Um, and that's a eutrophic lake, right? And this brings us to the idea of cultural eutrophication, which is, you know, humans altering the amount of inputs into a system uh, greatly increases the pace at which eutrophication happens. And that's what we call cultural eutrophication, right? So primarily our cultural eutrophication uh, has disturbed the nutrient balance, right? Uh, by adding uh, phosphorus mainly, also nitrates, but, but phosphorus to a lot of these, causing excess plant growth, excess algal growth, excess phytoplankton growth, which use up then the dissolved oxygen, right? And this is what we call human-induced or cultural eutrophication, right? Now, instead of talking decades or millennia, we're talking, or, you know, um, you know, hundreds of years or millennia, we're talking, you know, this can happen in a few decades to a, to a lake. To take a look at uh, Spring Lake, right? Right outside uh, um, the Grand River mouth there. Uh, um, that's a, a highly eutrophic lake. Fairly gross lake, not one I want to swim in that much, right? Um, this is a big problem on many smaller inland lakes as well, like I said, like with uh, Spring Lake, right? And again, we have greatly increased the rate at which uh, eutrophication happens, right? They are still happening and there's still issues with the Great Lakes, but they have a lot of people working to clean them up as well. And like I said, cleaning up the Great Lakes has been kind of one of our, our big good things that we've done as humans, right? So let's look at some of these different uh, pollutants here. First, we have nutrients. Again, we've talked about those a few times, mainly phosphorus and nitrates. Um, this includes, uh, you know, as we know, agricultural fertilizers, right? Um, lawn fertilizers, but things we might not think of, you know, partially treated sewage, right? So it goes through the sewage uh, treatment plant 
but maybe it doesn't pull out all the phosphorus and nitrates from that, right? Detergents and soaps as well, laundry detergent, dishwashing detergent, soaps. These have lots of phosphorus and nitrates in them. And then of course, when we flush them down, uh, the you know, or wash them down the sink, then, then uh, they go into uh, um, uh, our sewer system, right? So what can be the effects of eutrophication, right? Well, first of all, like I said, you increase that algae biomass. You therefore subsequently increase the phytoplankton biomass, which really, you know, not only decreases clarity, but reduces light levels and decreases the levels of oxygen. So here's a highly eutrophic lake. I mean, look, even the rocks here are staying green with that nasty algae, right? This can have negative consequences like fish kills. And here's a bunch of fish um, along Great Lakes here that have been killed basically by uh, suffocating to death in their own water. Again, there's so much algae and so much phytoplankton. All of the those little phytoplankton have used up all the dissolved oxygen. Now there's no more dissolved oxygen for the fish to breathe and they literally suffocate in the water, right? Not only this, uh, but these algal blooms, uh, they're toxic, right? They're, they're harmful to, to human and animal health. You don't want to drink this stuff and kill you, right? Uh, it degrades, obviously, water quality. And do you want to come visit a beach like this? No, I don't think so, right? Then it reduces tourism, and, and tourism is huge, multi-multi-billion dollar industry here just in Michigan alone, right? So having lakes like this and dead fish all over them like this does not do good for tourism, does not do good for the local economy, right? 40 billion a year we generate in tourism, right? So we wanna keep that up. That keeps our, you know, our jobs here and all that kind of stuff. So we reduce tourism, right? We reduce uh, money coming into our economy, right? So again, uh, these algal blooms, not only can they, they uh, use up all the water or all the oxygen in the water, but they're, they're deadly and toxic uh, uh, themselves. The green here is from this uh, cyanobacteria, which is blue-green algae, right? Uh, specifically one called microcystis uh, that affects the Great Lakes, right? Uh, this produces noxious smelling scums on the surface, right? It's toxic to human and wildlife, right? And Lake Erie, which is the shallowest and the warmest of our, our Great Lakes, has been deemed the poster child for eutrophication. Indeed, I've had students who've lived at, you know, in cities around Lake Erie, and they said, you know, at least once a summer they'll have it where they say you got to drink bottled water. You can't drink even city water because uh, – there's too they get it from the Great Lakes and there's too much algae in there and it's dangerous for human consumption, right? And the same thing happens in oceans. They're called red tides and it's actually a red algae that causes those. But again, you get red tides, you don't want to eat the fish and stuff that have eaten that red algae because it's, it's deadly for humans. We don't have red tides here, but we have green tides, right? So just giving you an example, here's a boat that's been churning up all this scum. This is from Lake Erie, right? Look at all this scum out in the middle of the lake, and you can just, it's like just thick. That's nasty, right? And here's an example of a satellite photo showing these algal blooms in Lake Erie, right? So here's algal bloom, right? This one is in, uh, um, let's see, when was this? This was in July, and this is like three weeks later. Um, you can see how much that, that algal bloom has exploded, right? And now it's affecting water quality all up and down this western half of, of Lake Erie, right? And the reason that it grows so well in Lake Erie is because it is the warmest of the lakes, right? Right, another uh, pollutant is organic matter. Organic matter, I mean, I mean poop, I mean fecal matter, waste, right? This is one of the most abundant and problematic uh, pollutants out there, right? Um, this organic matter is broken down by bacteria, uh, many of which require oxygen to breathe, right? So the more organic matter in the, uh, in the water, the more oxygen is going to be needed by this bacteria to break down uh, the poop, basically, right? So eventually, again, you get most of this oxygen getting used up by that bacteria. 
And then farther breakdown must then be anaerobic in the presence of, you know, or in the lack of, of back or uh, air or oxygen, right? Now, this leads us to the idea of a biochemical oxygen demand, right? Biochemical oxygen demand. How much oxygen is needed to break down that organic matter, that poop, right? So the more organic matter in the system, the higher the biochemical oxygen demand, right? So again, um, you have a high biochemical oxygen demand. This is gonna take a lot of that oxygen away from other organisms such as fish, right? So here you can see where we have, you know, these big feedlots and here's a, a human sewage treatment plant, right? Um, water running off of this into local streams increases that biochemical oxygen demand and here's uh dead fish again in, in the great lakes due to again all of that and we don't see that green stuff around so we know it's not from algae right it's from uh there being too much sewage in the water and all of the bacteria using up all the oxygen to break down that sewage taking it away from the fish right? pathogenic microbes is another one right uh, <clears throat> an example, fecal coliform bacteria we know as E. coli, right? It's a common bacterium. It lives in human and animal intestines and, and in natural amounts, or, you know, it's a good, it kind of helps break things down for you, but in too big of amounts, it's toxic, right? Now, there are hundreds of different E. coli strains. Most are relatively harmless. They give you things like traveler's diarrhea, you know, annoying, but not going to kill you. Um, but there are a couple exceptions. One of these is E. coli strain 157-H7. I don't know why. Anyway, but uh, the idea is this is a very powerful um, toxin uh, and can su cause severe illness and death. And when you see those food safety alerts right like so say all the all the romaine lettuce has been pulled from the shelves because of uh you know e coli contamination means basically too much poop's been sprayed on it somehow right um uh through fertilizers and all that right and uh um this is uh, again you know the 2018 i think just this year earlier this e coli strain uh was found again in some some different lettuce varieties and then they had to pull all those lettuces off the shelf because they were killing people right so how does this bacteria get into the water at all right first of all sewage treatment plants right the effluent waste or the water that comes off of them right goes right directly in back into streams and, and rivers right so here in grand rapids in our in our uh, wastewater treatment plant downtown right they uh, they treat the water and they dump it right back into the grand river right having been cleaned theoretically, right? And hopefully we did clean most of the bad stuff out of there, right? Storm sewers, right? Storm sewers uh, do not go down to, you know, your 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 natural, your, 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 your sewage uh, treatment plants, right? Storm sewers just kind of run and then dump it right into the lake or the river or whatever is nearby, right? So if you have, you know, animal waste that gets flushed down into the storm sewers, right? Um, it's going to, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, go right out into the lakes, right? Uh, septic systems, a lot of people here in Michigan, especially out in the country and stuff, use septic systems. They aren't hooked up to city sewers, right? They have their own septic system. If those are leaking or, you know, not maintained well or overflowing, right? That can put that, you know, sewage right into the, the water cycle, right? And in numerous locations around our Great Lakes, Right, raw sewage goes directly into the lakes. Right, um, I mentioned Toronto. I don't know why I pick on them, which because I got a good uh, video of, of that, I guess. But uh, um, raw sewage goes directly into the lakes to prevent, you know, too much pressure uh, from building up in the in the sewage system. Uh, so excess goes just directly right out into lakes, just raw sewage into the lakes. Right. I uh, don't think that we don't do that, you know, in like Detroit and, and, and uh, uh, Chicago as well. I mean, it is happening there as well, right? Cattle and other domestic animals, right? Standing in the river, pooping in it, standing on the side of the river and getting washed in, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So there's lots of different ways that uh, there's bacteria can get in there, right? This can also contain, you know, contribute to pathogens getting in the surface water and the groundwater, right? 
Um, and also, you know, um, when your local favorite uh, swimming hole is closed down because there's too much E. coli, it means there's too much fecal matter in the water. Let's see if I got this. Oh, here we go. Here's my grossness. This is why I kept picking on Toronto. An unfortunate, disturbing finding, actually, by a Lake Ontario Conservation Group. Everything that you would probably see flushed down a toilet. Condoms, steam tampons, wet naps, all dripping, all used, all slimy. Yeah, it's a horrible thing. It's that, honestly, I was completely alarmed by it. That's pretty gross. Um, you've heard the news, you've read the headlines, but do you really know Toronto Harbor's story? This is Toronto Harbor, the heart of Canada's largest city. On a summer day, Toronto Harbor teems with life. Sailors, paddlers, and ferries crisscross the water. Birds find haven here. Trout, perch, pike, and bass swim below the surface. Millions of tourists visit every year. Toronto Harbor makes this city. After a busy weekend at Harbourfront, you can always find litter in Lake Ontario. Food containers, cigarettes, and other garbage are bad for the lake, but pollution's reach in the Toronto Harbour goes beyond litter. Look closely. There is sewage here, too. Sewage can cause rashes or illness. It can kill fish and birds or contaminate their food. The sight of sewage can drive away residents and tourists. Toronto's sewage problem is no secret. City officials are spending $1.2 billion to capture and treat more sewage by 2028. In the meantime, sewage flows into Toronto Harbour every time it rains. There is no cleanup after a spill. There is no water quality monitoring for boaters. The Waterkeeper Investigation Team raised money to test harbour water this summer. They wanted to know the truth about Toronto Harbour water quality. Investigators collected 166 water samples from the harbour. Two-thirds of the samples failed to meet basic Ontario standards for environmental protection. The dirtiest samples failed to meet federal standards for safe boating and paddling. Hmm. Did you say that? A third of them said it's, it's so nasty you can't swim in, on it, in it. And then a third of them said it's so nasty you can't even drive your boat across it, right? Can't even be in the boat on it, right? That is gross. This place near Bathurst Street and the Waterfront Neighborhood Center had high bacteria all summer long. Even when the water looked clean, bacteria levels sometimes soared. Sewage pollution was also found in other places near the water's edge. Are you wondering how sewage gets into the Toronto Harbor in the first place? There are nine key places where pipes empty into the harbor, underwater, hidden from sight. These pipes contain sewage from homes and businesses. When there is too much, they are designed to overflow into the lake to relieve pressure on the system. Rain makes things worse. Investigators found that most of their failed water tests, 73%, occurred after rain. That's because rain fills sewers. It combines with sewage that sends more pollution through the pipes and into the harbor. The headlines sound scary. Sewage in Toronto Harbor. But headlines don't tell the whole story. The further you go from those nine outfall areas in the mouth of the Don River, the cleaner the water gets. By the time you reach the islands, Lake Ontario is mostly clean. If we stop the sewage flows, we can have our harbor back. We've done it before. Most beaches in Toronto failed water quality tests in the 1990s. Today, you can swim without worry at most city beaches. That's what hard work and infrastructure investment can do. That's what happens when people decide it's time to win back Lake Ontario. Every success story starts with people like you deciding they want clean water. We can make this choice for Toronto Harbour. You can help. 
If you boat or paddle or surf in Toronto Harbour, your story is important. If you take the ferry to the islands or catch fish here, your voice should be heard. Your story is the real story. Do you love this harbour? Do you want it clean? Then you need to speak up. It's time to make new headlines. Tell us your story. Mm-hmm.